Last night I lay a sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem, beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, Methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. My dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The morn was cold and chill, and the sun grew out of As the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill, as a shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing. changed new earth there seemed to be I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea the light of God was on its streets the gates were open wide and all who would might enter and no one was denied. No need of moon or stars by night or sun to shine by day. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Sing for the night is over. 
Well, good morning. And welcome to worship today. It is wonderful to gather on this day, this Palm Sunday morning. Uh, and thank you to the gentleman for leading us in as we are uh, in that tension this morning uh, of living between the old Jerusalem and looking forward to the new Jerusalem. And in all of that is our Savior, is our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we come to worship and praise Him. Welcome to those of you who are visiting today. We're glad that you're here and pray that you'd be blessed in our time together. Uh, several announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, down in the fellowship hall, there is a sign-up still uh, for our Monday Thursday service. Uh, we are looking for readers uh, to participate in that, and if you are shy uh, and don't like to read or don't think, well, the pastor's going to give me this nice long part, there are a lot of one-line parts, uh, and so if that is going to help you and urge you to participate, uh, consider doing that. You can put a, a one by your name or something uh, but that'd be fine. Also down there, there's a birthday card uh, for Rosella Fern. Her birthday is next week, Monday, April 5, uh, and so we want to encourage her uh, and feel free to sign that card this week or next week. I uh, also want to give a, an invitation and an encouragement uh, to consider coming to the afternoon Bible study. Uh, you see in the midweek emails, you see in the bulletin uh, that we're looking at the ever-fun topic of sexuality right now, uh, and the CRC is, is giving us this report uh, that is before, uh, before Synod next year. Uh, and so we're kind of looking at that. Uh, and these are important matters, not just for the CRC, uh, but for people's lives, for, for families, for our friends, uh, for our churches. Uh, and, and so as we dive into a lot of different areas, uh, we're looking at what does Scripture say and how do we care for people uh, who might be affected by these things. One more announcement, uh, and I've been told that, that you likely know more about this than I do because it's been a thing in the past, uh, but there is a meat sale going on right now uh, to raise money for Daniel Kabuji, uh, and so if you are interested in that, there is money in the fridge, or there is meat in the fridge at the farm. That'd be great if there's money, and just go ahead and, and take it, you know, $3 for whatever you want, uh, but $3 a pound, uh, if you're interested, be sure to, to do that as, as we raise money for him and his ministry. Well, our call to worship then it comes from Psalm 118. It brings us to the word, Hosanna. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. O oh Lord, our gracious God and Father, we give you thanks that you are our Savior. We give you thanks that, that as we hear again and again today, that you have come. That, Lord, there is no one else that we ought to be waiting for, but it is you. It is Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who gave himself for sinners. Lord, how thankful we are for that, for your love, for your grace and mercy. And Lord, we simply desire to praise you, to give you what you deserve. And so, Lord God, we pray that this day, that for Jesus' sake, you would cause our voices and our thoughts, our meditations and our hearts to draw near to the crowds who praised you long ago. All this we pray in your Son's precious name. Amen. Let's stand to sing, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
we come into the presence of our God, we know that he is with us and we receive his greeting. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to praise our God with clap you hands, all you people. Maybe seated. For our time of confession and assurance of pardon this morning, we turn to one of our communion preparatory exhortations as we look forward to celebrating Holy Communion this week. And so I invite you to follow along uh, and to join in the prayers uh, as marked on the screen. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, let us remember that Scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We are taught that eating and drinking unworthily brings judgment upon ourselves. And so let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your grace that we may repent sincerely of all sin, find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Savior's infinite love in his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the atoning power of our Savior's death and for our share in his victory over sin. Open our hearts as we prepare for this celebration that it may strengthen us in our faith, establish us in our hope, and confirm us in our love. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth of God as taught by Scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. By this faith, we take to ourselves Christ and all his benefits, so that for us to live is Christ. Lord God, author and finisher of all true believing, confirm our faith as we prepare for this holy sacrament. Let us further examine our hope. All Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all our righteousness is in him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ. They find in him their strength and victory, and they confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to celebrating this holy supper anew with him in the kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Most merciful Father, fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. And finally, let us also examine our love, our love both for God and for our neighbors. Remember the great and first commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Let us consciously determine to live a life of loving service to him, 
through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbors as Christ commands. Do we unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, justice, humility, and contentment? Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? Dear Father, daily increase in us the greatest gift of all, our Christian love. If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach the table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, who hope in works or virtues of their own, and who do not show love to God and neighbor, have no true place at the Lord's Supper. And yet we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy. Gracious God, we love and adore you in Christ our Lord. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself in him. We rejoice in being received as your children. Prepare us by your Holy Spirit for the sacrament. Help us to come in the assurance that by it we shall be spiritually revived and strengthened in faith, hope, and love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we continue to meditate and give thanks to God for his gift, let's sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. we 
As we go to our God in prayer this morning, uh, I don't think it takes too long to look at the bulletin and see that uh, our prayer list is long, uh, that there are many needs in our community and in communities around us and in the world. Uh, and so let's go before our God, uh, the one who hears and who cares for us. O Lord our God, what a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. We are reminded this morning, Lord God, that you indeed are both of those, not because we've decided that, not because we're just throwing names and, and attributes and characteristics for you out into uh, our speech and our vocabulary, but Lord God, we hold on to these things, we cling to them, we grip them with all our might. Because your word tells us that. That you are our deliverer, that you are our hope. Lord God, it is because you are those things, not only for our eternal salvation, but Lord God, for our being, for our existence, for our faith, for our comfort, Lord God, that we come to you now on this morning, our burden with concern. Lord God, burden with the things that, that have been found out in the last week, for diagnoses that have happened, for, for the loss of, of loved ones and, and friends and community members, uh, that we've been burdened as we turned on the news to hear uh, of, of natural disasters and devastation that have happened uh, across the, the southern portion of our country, Lord God, in which people have been injured and lost their lives and lost their property. Lord God, that as we have continued to listen to the news and, and, and look on at, at images that are, are, are traveling across oceans, Lord God, we see what's happening in different parts of the world, and, and Lord, we are struck in a bit of disbelief at, at, at protest and in the actions of, of military and governments in other parts of the world. And so, Lord God, we come with heavy hearts and heavy minds this morning before you. That as happy as we are and as joyful as we desire for this day to be, to praise you for who you are and what you do, Lord God, we are in this tension of the Holy Week, when you gave yourself even unto death. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would hear our prayers this morning, that you would look favorably upon those who are struggling with illness, who are struggling with sadness, who are struggling with grief right now. Lord God, as we think not only of Al this week and of Mary Claire this week, but Lord God, as we also think of Jody and of Raquel and the diagnoses of each of these men and women for cancer in various forms. Lord God, we give you thanks that, that for all of them, there are potential treatments. And while treatment doesn't necessarily mean cure, that everything will be fixed, Lord God, there are medical interventions that you have given to us. And Lord God, we pray that, that through those means that you will work, and, and in your miraculous power, Lord God, that you would bring healing, that you would extend life, that you would enable each of these and their families, Lord God, to turn and depend on you for their strength. Lord God, we lift up to you this morning the, the Sabelko family from the, the school. Uh, and Lord God, we give you thanks for the birth of a baby and, and for Caleb, but Lord God, we pray too for, for his health. Uh, Lord God, as he was born extremely early, 
Uh, and Lord God, as he is small, and, and Lord God, there are things that, that have transpired in the last week that uh, have been cause for concern and, and great fear of, of what may happen. And yet, Lord God, there have also been signs of your miraculous work in healing, and we pray, O oh God, that that would continue, that you would give him life, and that you would surround this family with your love. We pray this, Lord God, this morning for those who are going through different struggles, different times of waiting, with different difficulties, whether they be at work or school, Lord God, and in uh, interacting with coworkers and friends. Lord God, we pray for healing among relationships. We pray for, for justice where, where faults have been done. Lord God, we lift up to you uh, the bulls as, as they continue to, to heal and, and to deal with the effects of COVID. Lord God, and we pray that you would be with them and, and pray for uh, their, their families as well, Lord God, that, that as we've gone through this, uh, we've seen COVID in our midst in the last couple of months. Uh, Lord God, we know that it is not an easy journey for, for every person, and so, Lord, we pray that you would bring healing and comfort and draw people near unto you. Lord God, we pray this morning for, uh, for our brothers and sisters in uh, the church in uh, in Minnesota, who are from Southeast Asia. Uh, Lord God, for Pastor Fo and for his flock, as, as they think about their family members and their friends and, and others who, who love God in their homeland and, and where they came from. Lord God, we do. We think of what's happening in, in Myanmar, and, and Lord God, for, for the, the cruelty, for the violence that's happening there. And Lord God, we feel thousands of miles away rather helpless to do anything. Uh, and Lord God, we, we don't know much about what to say or, or how exactly things should be done or, or, or what this answer is, what all the, the situation entails. But Lord God, we pray for them. Lord God, who have loved ones, who are experiencing fear, uh, who have been pushed out of their homes, Lord God, who are fleeing away into jungles without shelter. Lord God, they aren't just going out on a camping trip, but Lord God, they are fleeing for their lives. And so we pray, O oh God, that, that you would bring comfort to the midst of, of anxiety and worry, but Lord God, we pray that, that you would bring an end to the violence in that part of our world. Lord God, we pray too for the surrounding countries that they would help citizens who are fleeing. Lord God, that they would support them and give them what they need. Lord God, we continue to lift up to you this morning those who are, are going through various ailments uh, that have not been mentioned. Uh, Lord God, for Andrea, she continues to wait for, for back surgery. Uh, for others, Lord God, for Rosella and Nancy as they uh, continue their lives and in their days in uh, the care center and in the apartment. Lord God, we pray that you'd be near unto them and we give you thanks for uh, the, the lightening up of restrictions over there to allow uh, for, for more visits to happen. Lord God, we give you thanks for uh, just the, the renewal and, and the burst of excitement and energy and hope that that gives to those relationships. Lord God, we pray now that you would continue to be with us. Lord God, if, if we are not among those who have been mentioned in this prayer, we may feel that um, our lives are, are pretty simple and easy or our lives are being ignored, and yet, Lord God, we know that is not the case. That you do not ignore us. But Lord God, you pray, or you teach us rather, that we would weep with those who weep, that we would mourn with those who mourn, that we would rejoice with those who rejoice. And so, Lord God, make us able to do that this day and in the week ahead. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. So someone would invite forward the boys and girls for our children's message. How are you guys? Good. Well, guys, I forgot my paper. That's not good. All right. We're going to do something special today. Does that sound good? We're going to have a parade. You up for that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Someone is shaking their head. That's not exciting. All right. Do you guys know what day it is? It's not Easter yet. Palm Sunday. 
That's Palm Sunday, all right? So uh, this is the beginning of the week in which we are. We're looking forward to Easter, but something happened first in the Bible. We're going to hear in a few minutes how uh, Jesus, when he was coming to Jerusalem, uh, went and he told his disciples, two of them, to go and fetch him a colt that would be tied up in a village, uh, and he was going to ride on that. Uh, and where palms come in is in what happens next. Uh, Matthew tells us in his gospel, a very large crowd of people spread their cloaks. They spread their coats all on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And these people went in front of Jesus and his disciples, and they went behind them, and they shouted the words that we've said a few times today, Hosanna. Do you guys know what Hosanna means? Any ideas? Brooks, no. You sure? Nah. Hosanna means save. It's a way to praise someone who has saved us. Uh, and so Luke, the one whose book we've been following and reading in the Bible, says that the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And, and so Jesus, when he came, he really meant something for them. Uh, we don't know exactly what they understood or what they believed at that time. They definitely didn't know what was going to happen in just a few days, that Jesus was going to be put on a cross. But right now, they knew that he at least deserved this that this was a sign that Jesus was a king for them. Uh, and, and we know that, that Jesus never sat on a throne or, or got a crown here on earth, right? He didn't have that. Uh, and yet we know that he is in heaven where he's on a throne right now. And when he returns, uh, we get the hope that, that he's going to be the king forever and we'll get to praise him if we've believed in him. But right now today, you see I have more of these, right? Can each of you guys take one of these? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. You want two? All right. You're good. We got plenty. All right. Brooks, you want one? Here you go, dude. All right. So what we're going to do in a moment is there's going to be a video that plays, and we're going to sing along with it, and I want you guys to follow me. I want you to try and sing, but if you don't know the words, that's okay. But we're going we're gonna to wave our palm branches as we go, okay? And this is how the song goes. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name. With hearts full of praise, be exalted, O Lord my God, Hosanna in the highest. All right, so we're going to have that song. There's going to be a video playing with that, and we're going to go, and we're going to walk through here a couple times, and then we're just going to stand across the pulpit, okay? And when we're up here, I just want you guys to wave our palm branches, and when we get up here, I'm going to ask the congregation to join in the song. Does that sound good? So you guys won't be singing by yourselves? All right. Go ahead, Owen, if you would, and we'll get started. Come on, let's stand up, okay?
What does Hosanna mean? Savior. Savior. Very good. That's what we're thinking about. All right, let's pray together, okay? Dear Lord God, we give you thanks for this day and for these boys and girls for being good sports this morning and uh, coming up here to to lead us in praise. Uh, Lord God, we pray that you would help us to further understand uh, what it means for you to be our Savior uh, and what the people understood back then. Uh, Lord God, we praise you uh, that you do not leave us and that you promise us a wonderful future. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. All right, guys, you can go back to your seat. Do not poke your brothers or sisters. You're just going to leave them. That's all right. If you guys want them after the service, you can come get them, all right? We got plenty. My kids were not enthused with that. Not <laughs> surprised. All right, well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke 19, to this familiar event, the triumphal entry, Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. Uh, And as joyful as we usually think about this passage and this event being, uh, Luke's account ends on a rather serious note uh, and a rather somber ending uh, as Jesus approached Jerusalem. Uh, And so we'll be looking at that too. Let's hear the word of the Lord. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went, and they found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They shouted, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what would you do, or how would you act if you knew that someone with power or a celebrity or someone you admire was coming through Baldwin or Woodville or Hammond on their way to the Twin Cities, and you knew they're going to stop at that quick trip on the interstate, uh, what would you do? Uh, Would you go out and, and say, well, maybe I'll get just a glimpse of them. Maybe I'll get to take a selfie with them. Maybe I'll get to shake their hand or hug them if we aren't under quarantine. Maybe we'll talk with them. Maybe we'll get their autograph. And maybe you think to yourself, well, it it depends on the person, right? It depends how I feel towards them. Uh, If it's the president at the time and I didn't vote for them, well, I could care less if they're here or not. I'm not going to go see them. Uh, But if it was the president you voted for, 
If it was your favorite actor, your favorite singer, your favorite social media vlogger, maybe you showed up that day as early as you possibly could to see that person. And part of me wants to say, well, who cares, right? We're, we're not shallow like that. I mean, they're just other people. That's no big deal. And yet I remember uh, last summer, two summers ago, rather, when this train came through town, uh, and if you were there, as I know some of you were along with me, there were huge crowds that gathered around, right? People came out and they cheered it on. They stood in awe. They saw how close they could get. Could they get the best picture of the big boy steam locomotive? And if we did that for a train, I'm sure a celebrity would draw at least that much attention. Well, last Sunday, we jumped ahead in the account of Jesus' final week. We jumped to Thursday night and into Friday morning when Jesus was on trial before various leaders. And we're going to return to that part of the account later this week when we meet on Thursday night. And we're going to be reminded again that Jesus was mocked and ridiculed and insulted. We're going to remember that, that he was beaten by soldiers and, and scoffed at by them and by the religious leaders, that he was scoffed at by those who, who likely were spectators, and he was scoffed at by at least one of the criminals on the cross. What a striking difference there is between those events and where we're at today. What a striking difference in treatment that Jesus received at the end of this week compared to the beginning. That the respect and the reverence, the awe, the honor that Jesus is owed was stripped away. But not this day. Not as he made his way to Jerusalem. And so our first point this morning, what's going on here? Well, the Lord and the King has come. And if there's any confusion for those of us who are reading the Gospel of Luke about who this is, who Jesus is, is representing, uh, Luke cuts through any of that, and he tells us Jesus is the Lord and the King. And that shows up in our very first verses, that Jesus told these two disciples to go to the village to get this colt, and if they're questioned, just tell them the Lord needs it. And if you were following closely on the screen or in your Bibles, you likely notice that the word Lord has a capital L. That's in the NIV. That's in other common translations as well. It shows up in verse 31, again in verse 34. And what that tells us is that the translators are recognizing it as a proper noun as a proper name, and that is, is only used about one thing, and that is the Lord God, right? The Holy One, the one true God. It's not just uh, about owners or, or property uh, managers. It's not just about masters that, that may hold that title. Now, maybe you wonder, though, well, how can they make that differentiation? I mean, that doesn't come to us all that easily through the Greek, uh, and, and I wonder that, too. Well, at least part of it goes back to, to what Luke writes. And if you see in, in, in the verse up there, you find that the Greek word that Luke assigns to the owners of this donkey is the very same word, kyrios. It's this word that means Lord. And, and so he recognizes that, yes, they are the lords of this donkey, but the Lord needed it for his mouth. It's not a mistake. That is what they're talking about. The word kyrios is used over a hundred times in the Gospel of Luke alone. It's an extremely common word. And again, the majority of those refer to the Lord God. And he's telling us that this is who Jesus is. The Lord has come. Again, the word Lord also shows up in verse 38, where we find our other identifier here that he is the king. The Palm Sunday crowd was shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the Greek word for kings and kingdoms is the word basileus or basileus. Uh, unlike kyrios, which is used all that frequently, uh, this word is not used frequently. This is the first time that the word king is applied to Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and thereafter we find it when Jesus is in his trial. 
And, and so for the Jewish religious leaders to, to accuse Jesus of claiming to be a king, for, for the Sanhedrin to pass that along to Pilate, that he is now the king of the Jews, for that to make its way into the soldier's mouth and on the sign on the cross seems to come back to this event. This event that Jesus told the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees that he would not quiet the crowd. Again, as I told the boys and girls, Jesus is the king who's reigning right now in heaven and he'll do so forever. Uh, But to name Jesus as the king here in this setting uh, is, is not to say, well, he has to have a throne on earth. But it has us look back further to the Old Testament. Again, maybe you know it's, it's in every gospel. There's a footnote on this passage to go and look at Zechariah 9, verse 9. And this is the fulfillment, we believe, of this verse. The word of the Lord was given, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, daughter of Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And for those of you who are wondering, well, what's the Hebrew word for king? It's the word melech. That's how you pronounce that fun arrangement of symbols up there that I I hate looking at. But again, you think about all that Jesus went through in the week ahead. Maybe as, as we would be original readers of this gospel, people living in the years and in the decades immediately after this happened, maybe if we heard the name Jesus, all we would think about is what happened at the end of the week. The terrible events, the tragedy, that that a humiliated guy was simply executed on a cross. And yet Luke tells us by way of the Holy Spirit to not forget about this event, to not forget about what has been made clear on this day in Luke 19. Whether or not the crowds actually understood what they were saying or just repeating what others had put forth does not change that this is the truth. That Jesus is the Lord associated with the Holy One of God. And He is the King. He is the Righteous One and He has salvation with Him. No one else can be honored like this. The King and the Lord has come. Well, what does that mean for us? Well, we move on to our second point now. We owe Jesus our rejoicing. We owe Jesus our rejoicing. Again, you see those first two lines of of Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, the daughter of Jerusalem. And those words, you you can quite easily see if you know your Old Testament, uh, are about Israel. Right? It's about the covenant Jews. It's about God's people in the Old Testament. They had been judged by God because of their sin, because of their rebellion. But one day, the prophets tell us a a king will come. A king will be restored to the throne of David, and they are to praise that king. And they were given prophecy after prophecy before and throughout and after their invasions and their captivities to know that God had not forgotten them. He had not left them or forsaken them. Now certainly they they might have wondered, well, when is he going to come? There's 400 years in between the Old and New Testament period. Where is this king at? And yet if they went back to their prophets, they were to know that the king will come. Be ready for him. Well, with that understanding, we jump back into Luke 19, and we might wonder, well, what is the spark that sets off the whole Palm Sunday celebration? Was this really something that they saw in Jesus, or, or was this just part of the Passover joy, that, that every year they'd do something like this? On this day, they'd have this big parade with palm branches and cloaks and someone on a horse or a donkey. Well, Luke tells us in verse 37, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. There's no question, this parade, this entry, is all about Jesus. He's not just one piece in the parade, he's not just one float, or one thing to to gawk over, but it was his parade. It was his triumphal entry. 
But this parade wasn't just for the Old Testament people and nation of God, though. And what I mean by that is is that we are to contribute our voices to join theirs. We don't want the stones to have to cry out because there is silence and no recognition of Jesus. We must not and we will not be silent about our praise to him for what he has done and what he will continue to do. Brothers and sisters, worship, our our response of praise, our sacrifice of thanksgiving is a duty for us as Christians, for the redeemed of the Lord. It's something that ought not to be constrained to church buildings and to pews or constrained just to Sundays and holy days. It isn't something that requires us to stand still and, and rigid. Again, Jesus was asked to rebuke his disciples, likely because of what they were saying. He shouldn't be being called the king because they didn't see him that way. But the Pharisees, of course, also didn't like anything of what was going on there. They saw the way the people were going after Jesus, the other Gospels tell us. They saw the excitement and and the passion of this crowd being drawn to him. And yet what those crowds were doing is something for us to imitate. I want you to think back with me, or if you want, look in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we find that David uh, is bringing up a celebration because the Israelites have brought back the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines. And King David, we're told, was so excited that he danced in a linen ephod before the Lord with all his might while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and with the sound of trumpets. If you know this story, you know what happens next. You know that his wife was not too happy. His wife called him vulgar, in fact, or at least implied that. Uh, And then David responded, It was before the Lord. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more indignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Bringing up this issue of being dishonorable, he says, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now you're thinking, well, Pastor Dan's about to implement some dancing in in worship services, and and that's not my plan. Um, not a big dancer, unsurprisingly. Uh, don't enjoy it. Don't like to do it at weddings. I'll slow dance, but that's about the extent of it. But I'm not saying uh, that Christians must dance in worship services. I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian if you choose not to dance. But what I do want us to see is, is that praising God, celebrating before him and for him, is what we are to continue to do today. If we are truly grateful for what Christ has done on the cross, truly grateful for for what the Holy Spirit is up to and and being given to us and sanctifying us, if we're truly grateful that that we can look forward with a certain hope towards what is to come, then brothers and sisters, we can't help but, but tell and show and shout and sing to God. Even if others at times might perceive what we're doing as being humiliating, But our answer has to be the same as David's. It's not about us. It's about the celebration for the Lord. And so we bring the children up here this morning, we wave these palms around, and and maybe they thought that was silly as my kids did and and hate their dad now because of that, but but we can do that. And we can raise hands up for the Lord. We can stand still for the Lord as well. But this is our call, that we are to continue to raise the celebration to his name and not be silent. But it's from that high that we then come to the somber conclusion of this passage, the somber conclusion that is our our final point. Not only are we not to be silent to the Lord, but we're not to be silent for the yet lost. Do not be silent for the yet lost. I, I don't know that I've ever heard a pastor Uh, bring up these verses that Luke concludes with. Uh, Us pastors, just to give you a little bit of insight, we want Palm Sunday to be the happy day. We'll leave tears and and grieving and all that for later in the week, 
And, and so let's skip this part. And yet, unfortunately, Luke doesn't allow us that. Jesus doesn't allow us that. Verses 41 through 44 tell us, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. And Jesus describes what most believe to have been the, the, the effect of what would happen when Jerusalem fell in the year 70. But then he concludes about, again, why it will happen. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Despite what the folks on the road to Jerusalem said, and what they understood on this Palm Sunday, what they were celebrating, Jesus knew that the population of this city, that was the capital of Israel, the, the capital uh, of where his temple was, he knew that the populace there had largely ignored him. He knew that they wanted nothing to do with him. And so Philip Riken writes, notice the dramatic contrast between what the people were saying and what Jesus was feeling. The people were cheering, but the king of sorrows was crying. What some people still regard as a triumphal entry was for Jesus a tearful entry. He was sobbing with compassion for lost sinners who could not or would not see who he was. He was coming to them with the peace of salvation, but they refused to have it. If it hasn't come through clear enough yet this morning, this was Jesus. This was God in the flesh, Jesus. This was the Redeemer, Jesus. The Sovereign Lord, the Eternal King, Jesus. He was the one who had spent three years preaching and ministering and rebuking and encouraging and healing, and yet many despised him. The Lord in the flesh, and people didn't convert to Christianity just because he was around. Even with all of our reformed assumptions of predestination and God's plan and his choosing that goes back all the way to the creation of the world, Jesus still wept that he, the bringer of peace, was not recognized by many. We're living in a society today here in America, here in North America, here in the West that is increasingly similar to Jerusalem back then. I don't mean that, that we see a rise in, in Judaism without Jesus. I'm talking about a rise in ignorance towards Jesus. A rise in a disdain to anything associated with or offered by God, period. Again, there's plenty of Christians, plenty of pastors, plenty of church leaders and writers that are, are looking for answers. We're looking for solutions. We're looking for what is that one trick that is finally going to get people to wake up and come to Christ. And yet not even the Lord in the flesh, Jesus, could turn everyone to himself. Yes, we need to go after the lost. We need to share the truth of Jesus, the hope for sinners, the hope for eternal life, the peace that comes with knowing that by Jesus' sacrifice, by his blood on the cross, he has reconciled you to God because he loves you. Yes, the Holy Spirit is still at work growing the church, and we should not be silent in this sense either. We are to tell the good news. We're to go and make disciples of all nations. But don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, that while you may not be silent on this front, people may still ignore it. They may not see it. They may not recognize God's coming in the past and still to come. But do not let that deter you from going and making disciples. The 19th century English Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle wrote on this passage, We know but little of true Christianity if we do not feel a deep concern about the souls of unconverted people. A lazy indifference about the spiritual state of others may doubtless save us much trouble. To care nothing whether our neighbors are going to heaven or hell is no doubt the way of the world. 
But a man of the Spirit is very unlike Christ. If Christ felt tenderly about wicked people, the disciples of Christ ought to feel likewise. Brothers and sisters, may our faith not be just about me and Jesus. May it not just be about knowing intellectually the right things and and praising God. Again, we have to do that. We should do that. We should take joy in doing that. But we must also care, genuinely care for our neighbors, for their souls, for their eternal destiny. Let us not leave people having never had the opportunity to hear the love of Jesus, the truth of Christ, the only Savior. And as it's appropriate, may it cause us to weep as Jesus wept. And may we not be silent until Jesus comes again. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we think of uh, the call of the angels when Jesus was born. Peace on earth. We think of the cry of this crowd proclaiming peace in heaven. Lord God, we are reminded that we are people who are living in earth, and yet, Lord God, our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope is in heaven. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is in heaven. Lord God, we're longing for the day when you make all things new, when you bring heaven to earth when you bring about the new creation. But Lord God, for now we are here. We are in this place that you came down to. We are in this place where you were rejected and where you were believed on by some. Lord God, we pray that that we as your disciples, as your followers here in In the 21st century, Lord God, that that we would not be led astray, that we would not give up on proclaiming the gospel and praising you. We pray, O God, that that as you had this heart of compassion, this heart that, that cried out for the lost and for the rejecters of you, Lord God, would you give us the same passion and compassion for them. Lord God, we pray that in our midst, in our community, in our families, Lord God, in our other spheres of influence, we pray that that you would prime hearts for the hearing of you. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit would go before us, that your spirit would plant the seed, that your spirit would water and nurture, and Lord God, that along that way, you might use us as your instruments, your tools, your vessels to glorify you and and to share with you or share you with others. Lord God, we love you and we long to see others love you. Lord, help us to trust you and to not falter when we wonder why more don't believe. Help us not to falter when we don't see the, the ends and the successes that we think we should. And Lord, continue to do your work until you come again. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. For our song of response, let's stand to sing. All glory, laud, and honor.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we leave this place this morning, again, you're all welcome back on Thursday night as we have our Monday Thursday worship service with communion. Uh, and on Good Friday, there is a, a community-wide service that has been recorded. Uh, and so be sure to look online for that. More details will come uh, in the midweek bulletin. Uh, and then we come together again uh, on Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But as we go from this place, looking to the week ahead, go with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. We close this morning with, and all the people said amen. <laughs>